So comments on these wonderful papers today will be offered by uh, Dr. Christine Adams. Christine Adams is professor of history at St. Mary's College of Maryland. She earned her PhD in history from Johns Hopkins University and has published three books, most recently a co-edited volume with Tracy Adams entitled Female Beauty Systems, Beauty as Social Capital in Western Europe and the United States, Middle Ages to the Present. I also would like to mention that in the past few years, Dr. Adams has taken her scholarship into the really public sphere with editorials and outlets including Education Week, The Baltimore Sun, and The Washington Post. Look them up. <laughs> of the intriguing papers we've just listened to consider the messages contained in artistic representations. They offer new ways of decoding the art of the 17th and 18th centuries by thinking about the uses of history and the construction of cultural identities both by painters and their models. I wanted to consider the approaches that all three of our panelists today took by connecting them to a phenomenon that Tracy Adams and I have been interested in as we have been working on the creation of the royal mistress in France. We've been thinking about the apprehension of the courtly world as theater a phenomenon that we date to the 16th century as Francois I decorated his chateau with paintings resembling small stages, that is, paintings in which um, space was represented as three-dimensional. These paintings at Fontainebleau drew on classical models and invited viewers to look into an alternate reality populated by deities who offered a wide variety of models, many of them incompatible with Christian values, but compatible with courtly ones. The multivalent image of the Huntress Diana was, as Lynn Molinar notes, popular among noble women from the 16th century on, and was especially significant as a model for female courtiers, including royal mistresses. Moreover, between the reigns of Louis XII and Francois I, the number of female courtiers had risen significantly, giving women increased opportunities to learn techniques of effective self-representation from each other. The court of which Lynn writes, uh, and the galleries of the Fontfort and the, the, the beauties, is the result of these earlier changes. However, in a larger sense, Tracy and I are very much interested in a more general shift in the perception of space in the early modern era, from space that was already meaningful or present to what William Eggington calls theatrical spatiality. Sometime around the 15th century, the medieval perception of space as full, or in Eggington's words, as, quote, thickly laden with figures and impressed with meaning, capable of transmitting influences between bodies, and distinctly unfit for housing sharp distinctions, distinctions between the real and the imaginary, yielded to one emptied of this plenitude of its meaningful attachment to places and emblems." End quote. One result of this is that individuals could perceive of themselves as actors, embodying different roles. The change is obvious in the literal theater, but we also see this shift in court, where courtiers thought of themselves as both audience and players in the drama of court life, and enacted or at least observed different characters in different spaces. In addition, we see an increasing desire among courtiers to appear in paintings as different classical and historical figures. And this, of course, also has a history dating back at least to the Renaissance. So Lynn's analysis of the complicated meanings of Cleopatra in the 17th century certainly seems to be part of this larger phenomenon of theatricality and role playing. And it makes perfect sense that women such as the Mancini sisters would pose as Cleopatra and draw on the many mythologies associated with Cleopatra by that time, as femme forte, as seductress, as magnificent. By this point, the court and the larger public were ready to accept the layers of meaning and the play acting, the multiple representations that women at court drew on in portraying themselves. As a woman both notorious and magnificent, Madame de Montespan ascended to the position of official mistress of Louis XIV in the late 1660s, displacing Louis' more docile lover, Louise de la Valliere. It's not surprising that some of the more confident and assertive women at court were willing to play with the ambiguous le legacy of Cleopatra. I do find it interesting, however, that at least in the context of the 17th century, women and the men who painted them were more comfortable drawing on the beauty, the luxury, and the extravagance associated with the Egyptian queen than on the political authority with which earlier regions might have tried to associate themselves, which may tell us something interesting about politics at the court of Louis XIV. And I would be really interested in that period during which the interpretation sort of transitions from one to the other. The paintings that Christy Pacicero and Valerie Mainz examine also recognize implicitly or explicitly the importance of theatricality, of representation, and of presentation. Mm -hmm. However, by the 18th century, we see some important changes, perhaps suggesting that performances will be staged differently in Enlightenment France, and that painters will want to explore new themes. 
Christie's scrutiny of Antoine Watteau's paintings suggests that he was very conscious about the way that he positioned his soldiers and others in his painting. As she notes, heroic paintings of the battlefield were the topos for many early 18th century painters who depicted military scenes. To focus on the common soldier in a sympathetic fashion was a deliberate choice, and I find convincing her analysis that connects Watteau's choices to the Dutch genre of the guardroom scene, even though he highlighted class distinctions in a way that differed from the Dutch models. Perhaps this emphasis foreshadowed changes to come in France, both in the military and the country more generally, she suggests. But to go back to the idea of theatricality, the subject of Watteau's painting, The Halt, are very carefully posed. The aristocratic men and women to the left, the commoners, soldiers and women to the right. Each is performing a role. And yet, there is also a scene, to, an effort to make the scene a natural and very human one. We've come a long way from the magnificent of the paintings of courtiers and Cleopatras. Valerie Mainz is also interested in the painted portrait, which has, as she notes, significance beyond a record of appearance and, indeed, is, quote, carefully constructed in certain ways and within conventions and codes of representation. The painting of Antoine Loisier and his wife is a famous one, and to me it always looks like a photograph. Look, over here, you two. <laughs> and only Marianne looks at the camera, and it's clear that this is no random photo. Mm -hmm. Once again, we see two individuals performing a role. He, the scientist at work, recording his discoveries while his wife helps him with his work. Valerie's apt analysis of the scene puts together, as she notes, the elements that contribute to scientific work, the manual labor, the physical instruments of chemistry that allow the scientist to perform his experiments alongside the complicated operations of the mind. But also she draws on Marco Beretta, who suggests that the scientific instruments in the painting are precisely arranged to represent the stages of the chemical revolution that Lavoisier's work enabled. Here, Jacques-Louis David is not just a painter, but a director telling a story, the history of scientific work in the Age of Enlightenment, and constructing the identity of the savant, the scholar slash scientist. No one was more skillful than David at recounting a history and constructing identities as his paintings of the Oath of Parati, the Death of Socrates, the Tennis Court Oath, the Death of Marat, <laughs> oaths and deaths seem to come up a lot, <laughs> demonstrate. Although I, I find it interesting how, whatever David's intention, Madame Louvoisier dominates the portrait making the claim um, for her contributions to the scientific project despite the poofiness of her dress, which I think would be dangerous in a laboratory. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> for this comment, I thought rather than cover each presenter yeah. with a series of detailed questions, it might be better to leave those specific issues to later discussions. Each of these papers points to a larger project and is embedded and embedded in each of them are interesting themes I found difficult to connect to each other in a coherent fashion. Um, but I assume and hope each plans to further explore these themes in future works, and the audience will undoubtedly have questions about them. Lynn's interest in the relationship between the femme forte and the femme fatale and the consumption of pearls, um, Christie's effort to find the roots of the military, French military enlightenment and Dutch Republic, Valerie's exploration of the intricate connections between the painted portrait as both material object and record for posterity steeped in meaning. But the connection between painting, representation, and the construction of cultural identity is present in all three. In paintings, individuals were able to adopt new personae or shape the image that they, or the artist painting them, wanted to present to the world in much the same way that the modern individual curates her image on Facebook or Instagram or posts <laughs> other images with political intent. We still live in a theatrical world. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So um, I have mostly failed in my uh, role as chair. To, very hard. Well, we, uh, we failed too. <laughs> that was our failure. So we have technically, sorry, I think, come to really the end that. of our session. But I do want to give everyone a chance um, to ask questions if you would like to. I, it is also my responsibility to tell you that you will need to um, be out front at 4.30 to get on a bus to go to Bowdoin, if you are going to Bowdoin. And we can't be late for that date. So we have um, just, I would say, a couple minutes if anybody would like to ask a question. Hi. Um, thank you for a very rich panel. So I have a quick question um, regarding Cleopatra. And it starts with a question that's very pop culture which is if you look at Esthetic Seobedics en Egypte, Cleopatra is depicted repeatedly drinking salt dissolved in vinegar. That's sort of her thing <laughs> um, in living the lap of luxury. But I guess my question has to do with the role played by an Atlantic context within these depictions of Cleopatra. Right? Mm -hmm. The notion of pearls being deeply associated with American products. Um, and a symbol of America from the 16th century onwards, not so much necessarily for France, but certainly um, in the larger British Atlantic world. 
And this notion of magnificence and um, femininity and vinegar as something um, kind of conspicuous consumption that comes to characterize Caribbean cultures. I know that this is early on in the 17th century for France, but it seems like there's something in that, um, in these ways in which luxury, magnificence, femininity are working that are coming in dialogue Mediterranean and Atlantic at the same time. Thank you. I could have borrowed a mic. Uh, th thanks very much um, for your comment. Uh, I, uh, I've mostly done image searches, so I've not come up with too many Atlantic portraits, uh, except there's one notable one that's not, I think, incorporates an allusion to uh, the own Cleopatra, and it is the wife of one of the governor of a French colony, and of course the name is escaping me right now. I think she might be one of the married to a Colbert son. Uh, but she is posing with the um, kind of fruits of the colony, and that does include quite a, an enormous luminous pearl. So I can picture the, you know, the painting, and unfortunately the, um, the name of the noble woman is escaping me. But I, I, I think you're really right, and certainly this um, idea of uh, or the pose on Cleopatra is is prevalent at the English court too in Charles II, which makes this, you know, a lot of sense considering the court in exile between you know uh, Charles II and then James when he's in exile is is right back. So there's a lot of circulation both of people, artists, and representation there. Um, I'm sure it's more in the French colonies as well. I just haven't dug in yet. So thank you. All right. Again, my apologies for. Sorry, it's yes, really sorry. us. I'm, I'm, I'm running sorry over for putting you in that situation.